Throughout history, many rebels have led movements that changed history, but their stories are often hidden. In this video, we'll uncover the story of Sojourner Truth. Sojourner Truth is one of the most inspirational and influential figures in American history. Born into slavery, but rising to become a powerful advocate for freedom and equality, Sojourner Truth's journey is one of resilience and courage. Her story serves as a beacon of hope and inspiration for generations to come. In 1797, Isabella Bonfrey was born in a Dutch-speaking country in Swartekill, New York. She entered the world into a system that denied her humanity and basic rights from the moment of her birth. Isabella was born into slavery as the child of slaves. The tenth of twelve children, she was born to James and Elizabeth Bonfrey. James was captured from Ghana, while her mother was the daughter of slaves captured from Guinea. Isabella's early years were defined by the harsh realities of having everything stripped through the brutality of slavery. Raised by Dutch-speaking parents, her first language was Dutch. Her family was owned by Colonel Johannes Hardenberg, and when he died, the Bonfries were inherited by his son, Charles. Treated less than cattle, Isabella experienced firsthand the brutality and dehumanization inflicted upon enslaved individuals. At the age of nine, Charles died, and Isabella was sold alongside a flock of sheep to a man named John Neely. Neely was cruel and abusive and would brutally beat the young girl. Two years later, she was sold again, 18 months after that, sold again. Each slave master was seemingly more cruel than the other. Despite the oppressive conditions, Isabella possessed an indomitable spirit and an innate thirst for freedom. In 1815, Isabella found a glimmer of humanity when she fell in love, a fellow slave at a neighboring farm named Robert. Love can conquer all, and a young Isabella found comfort in Robert and wanted to marry him. However, they were denied by Robert's owner, Charles Catton Jr. The neighboring slave master forbade the two to get married because any children that Isabella would bear would not be considered his property. But Robert defied his master anyway and would sneak over to see Isabella. However, Charles Catton Jr. and his son caught Robert sneaking over and brutally beat him. They continued to beat him until Isabella's owner, John Dermott, intervened. Isabella never saw Robert again. Traumatic experiences continued to add up for Isabella. She was constantly sexually assaulted by John Dermott so much so that their non-consensual relationship made John's wife jealous. Things became worse when Isabella gave birth to a mixed baby girl, Diane. Isabella eventually was forced to marry an older slave named Thomas. Unfortunately, their first son, James, died. They went on to have three more children. The night is darkest before dawn. If you believe that, leave a power fist emoji in the comments. By the time Isabella was a married mother, Slavery had been the backbone of the American labor force for 200 years. The legal institution of human chattel slavery, comprising the enslavement primarily of Africans and African Americans, was prevalent in the British ships that landed in the New World in 1619, predominantly in the South. Slavery was established throughout European colonization in the Americas. Under the law, an enslaved person was treated as property that could be bought, sold, or given away. Slavery existed in about half of the U.S. states, until in 1780, Pennsylvania became the first state to abolish slavery. New York, where Isabella and her family were enslaved, wouldn't abolish slavery until 1827, but she wouldn't wait to be given her freedom. In 1826, Sojourner Truth's life took a transformative turn when she made the daring decision to escape slavery. With the abolishment of slavery slated to end in the state in 1827, John Dermott promised Isabella he'd grant her freedom a year early. However, when the time came, John reneged on his offer. With their infant daughter, Sophia, in tow, Isabella embarked on a perilous journey to freedom, guided by courage and the unwavering belief in the inherent dignity of all humanity. As a mother, she accepted the harsh reality that she could not bring her other children. Under law, they were not allowed their emancipation until they served as bound servants into their 20s. She later said, I did not run off, for I thought that wicked, but I walked off, believing that to be all right. Fleeing under the cover of darkness, she traversed treacherous terrain, evading capture at every turn until she found a safe haven in New Paltz, New York. After experiencing the darkest sides of the human experience, Isabella's resilience and faith began to bear fruit. Isabella and her daughter were taken in by the Van Wagenen family. The Van Wagenens were able to negotiate with John Dermott and paid $20 to keep Isabella safe until the emancipation officially became law. Under their protection, Isabella found out that John had sold her son, Peter. To make matters worse, 
He was then resold to an owner in Alabama. Chateau slavery is one of the most degrading and gross acts ever committed. Even still, there were degrees to its brutality and evil, and nothing was more hellish than being a slave in the South. So for Isabella, she couldn't allow for her son to suffer the horrors of a Southern plantation owner. With the help of the Van Wagenens, she took the issue to the New York Supreme Court. Using the name Isabella Van Wagenen, she filed a suit against Peter's new owner, Solomon Getney. In 1828, after months of legal proceedings, she got her son back, who had been abused by those who were enslaving him. Isabella got her son back, and in the process, she made history. Isabella became one of the first black women to go to court against a white man and win the case. Want more stories like this? Hit that subscribe button for more. Isabella's odyssey continued. On this winding epic of tragedy, love, heartbreak, and redemption, she then found her salvation. In 1827, she became a Christian and founded a Methodist church in Kingston, New York. By the 1830s, she was a vibrant speaker, leading religious revivals. Then in 1843, the Spirit of God spoke to her. On June 1st, Pentecost Sunday, she changed her name to Sojourner Truth. She chose the name because she heard the Spirit of God calling on her to preach the truth. She told her friends, the Spirit calls me and I must go. Taking along only a few possessions in a pillowcase, she traveled north to begin her calling of bringing about the abolishment of slavery. As an itinerant preacher, Truth met abolitionists William Lloyd Garrison and Frederick Douglass. Garrison's anti-slavery organization encouraged Truth to give speeches about the evils of slavery. She never learned to read or write. In 1850, she dictated what would become her autobiography, The Narrative of Sojourner Truth, to Olive Gilbert, who assisted in its publication. Truth survived on the sales of the book, which also brought her national recognition. Sojourner Truth's advocacy extended beyond the abolitionist cause to encompass the fight for women's rights. She met Elizabeth Candy Stanton and Susan B. Anthony and quickly championed their causes. She recognized the intersectionality of oppression and understood that the struggle for equality transcended racial boundaries. Throughout her life, Sojourner Truth tirelessly championed the rights of women, challenging societal norms and advocating for gender equality. Her affinity to both causes was no more evident than in her landmark speech, Ain't I a Woman? Ain't I a Woman? stands as a defining moment in the fight for women's rights, capturing the essence of her unwavering commitment to equality and justice. On May 29, 1851, in Akron, Ohio, Sojourner Truth delivered this impassioned address to a predominantly white audience, challenging prevailing notions of gender and race with profound eloquence and conviction. At the heart of the speech was a simple yet profound question, ain't I a woman? In those four words, she encapsulated the experiences of countless African-American women who had long been marginalized and excluded from the discourse on women's rights. The powerful orator, who stood nearly six feet tall, spoke from her own lived experience as a black woman, drawing attention to the intersecting forms of oppression she faced as both a woman and a person of color. With eloquence and forcefulness, she dismantled the prevailing stereotypes and prejudices that sought to diminish her humanity and deny her rightful place in society. She challenged the prevailing notion of womanhood that was often associated with delicacy, fragility, and submissiveness. She defiantly proclaimed her strength, resilience, and agency as a black woman, asserting her right to equality and dignity alongside her white counterparts. Her powerful words resonated with her audience, transcending the boundaries of race and gender to touch the hearts and minds of all who heard them. Ain't I a Woman not only challenged the status quo, but also served as a rallying cry for the women's rights movement. It inspired generations of activists to continue the fight for gender and racial equality, reminding them of the inherent worth and dignity of every individual, regardless of race or gender. In the years following her speech, Sojourner practiced what she preached when she split from Frederick Douglass. Douglass believed suffrage for formerly enslaved men should come before suffrage for women. Truth believed both could happen simultaneously. She continued to deliver landmark speeches. Truth dedicated her life to fighting for a more equal society for African Americans and for women, including abolition, voting rights, and property rights. When the Civil War started, Truth urged young men to join the Union cause and organize supplies for black troops. After the war, she was honored with an invitation to the White House and became involved in the Freedmen's Bureau, helping the formerly enslaved find jobs and build new lives. While in Washington, D.C., she lobbied against segregation, and in the mid-1860s, when a streetcar conductor tried to violently block her from riding, she ensured his arrest and won her subsequent case. 
In the late 1860s, she collected thousands of signatures on a petition to provide formerly enslaved people with land, though Congress never took action. Nearly blind and deaf towards the end of her life, Truth spent her final years in Michigan with her three daughters. Sojourner Truth's legacy endures as a testament to the power of one individual to affect meaningful change and to the resilience of the human spirit in the face of adversity. As we reflect on Sojourner Truth's legacy, may we be inspired to carry forward her vision of a more just and equitable society where all individuals are afforded the dignity and respect they deserve. Nat Turner's story of rebellion is one of the most infamous in American history. His act of defiance in the face of the brutality and horrors of slavery proved to be a watershed moment in the institution of America's chateau slavery. Let's learn more about him in this untold story of a rebel. A child was born on a plantation in Southampton County, Virginia, around October 2nd, 1800. The plantation was owned by a slave master, Benjamin Turner, who simply referred to the newborn as Nat. From a young age, Nat exhibited natural intelligence and a fervor for knowledge, surpassed by only a few. So much so, Nat taught himself how to read. Raised by his grandmother, Nat was deeply influenced by the Baptist faith, using the Bible as his primary source for learning. This source of education proved to play a crucial role in shaping his worldview and ultimately fueled his desire for freedom and justice. Chateau slavery is one of the most brutal acts in human history. Its goal was to dehumanize and completely eliminate any humanity of its African captives in order to reduce them to three-fifths of a human. As an enslaved person in the antebellum South, Nat Turner experienced firsthand the brutality and dehumanization of slavery. He witnessed the brutal lashings, mothers pulled from children, and the forced overexertion on the enslaved. Turner himself endured physical and psychological abuse. He was often forced to work brutal hours and harsh conditions, only to be rewarded with meager meals and ratty clothes. It was even believed that Nat was forced to read the Bible as a way to keep his fellow slaves in check. These acts deepened his resentment toward the institution of slavery and fueled his desire for liberation. Growing up, Nat hadn't known much about his parents, except that his father had allegedly ran away from the plantation. At 21 years old, Nat Turner, too, escaped. However, in an act of what he would describe as prophecy, he returned. If you're tuned in to this story of rebellion, hit that like button. After spending a month in the wilderness of Virginia, Nat Turner returned to his slave master and plantation, much to the bewilderment of the slave master and fellow slaves. Delirious and suffering from hunger, Nat Turner claimed a message from the Almighty said to him, return to the service of your earthly master. And so he did. Christianity has played a major part in the black community, and it dates back to slavery. During slavery times in America, biblical scripture was often used to justify slavery. Proponents of dehumanization would interpret texts to support their acts of abuse and condemn its captives for not following the rules of their masters. However, the Bible and Christianity would be adopted by those captured. Their interpretation of biblical scriptures gave them hope and empowered them during centuries of facing violence and the destruction of who they were. One of the few liberties enslaved blacks were allowed was the ability to commune for church. Even as blacks moved away from chateau slavery, Christianity has remained. After returning to the plantation, and over the next decade, Nat continued as a minister. Earning the nickname The Prophet, his congregation included not only slaves, but also some white folk as well. He even baptized a white man. During this time, the prophet began experiencing visions and religious revelations. He believed that God used the natural world as a backdrop for in front were omens and signs. Nat believed that God communicated with the world through him. The Lord has shown me things that had happened before my birth, he once said. He also believed that God communicated through things like the stars in the sky. While his neighbors just saw stars, Nat Turner believed they were the lights in the Savior's hands stretched east to west. One day, while working in the field, he found drops of blood on corn and interpreted it as dew from heaven. The most vivid of these visions came on May 12, 1828, when Turner heard a loud noise in the heavens. The Savior was about to lay down the yoke he had borne on the sins of men, and the great day of judgment was at hand. Turner believed that he was chosen by divine providence to deliver his fellow enslaved people from oppression and usher in a new era of freedom and justice. From 1822 until 1830, historians believe Nat Turner had at least 10 revelations. Many religious movements began with private revelations. Contemporaries like the father of Mormonism, Joseph Smith, 
and the father of the Adventist movement, William Miller, all claim to have been chosen by God. However, Nat Turner's previous revelations were rejected by Southampton's white population. Throughout the region, Protestant churches were interracial, their whites and free blacks communed separately. When Nat Turner tried to join one of the churches, the church refused on the basis of him being a slave and claiming to be a prophet. Undeterred, inspired by his faith, and emboldened by his convictions, the messages from God continued. Now, they began to show him a path for liberation for him and his enslaved people. And the toll was death. The sign to plan was clear as night. On February 12, 1831, the moon passed in between the sun and the earth. Nat Turner interpreted the solar eclipse as a sign to start planning the rebellion. He gathered the first conspirators. For the next several months, he gathered more and more believers to his crusade in secret. He used his congregation as his recruiting grounds and used his powerful oratory skills and biblical interpretation to rally dozens. He convinced them that he was indeed a prophet called upon by the Lord Almighty himself. Loving this Black Ball exclusive? Make sure you hit that subscribe button. The Rebellion A massive chain of events would set off the most infamous slave rebellion in American history. And it began on the other side of the country. In mid-August of 1831, Mount St. Helen erupted in Washington state. The volcanic reaction and subsequent smoke blocked out the sun. Back across the country in Southampton, Nat Turner waited patiently for a word from God. It came as an unusual smoky haze crossed the sun that day. Nat and his followers took the strange happenings in the sky as a sign to commence liberation. Researchers believe that odd things happening in the sky that day was a direct result of the eruption of Mount St. Helen. On the night of August 13, 1831, Nat Turner and a group of followers launched the rebellion. The band of rebels, armed with axes, knives, and other makeshift weapons, only had one path to liberation, total elimination of all slave masters and anyone connected to them. They began by killing Nat's current master, Joseph Travis, along with his wife, nine-year-old son, and nine-month-old baby. Turner's band moved from plantation to plantation, striking fear into the hearts of slaveholders and their supporters, targeting the enslavers and their families in Southampton County. The rebels killed approximately 60 white people, including men, women, and children, as they sought to overthrow the system of slavery. Nat's rebellion killed at least 55 white men, women, and children. The rebellion was short-lived, as local militias and state troops quickly mobilized to suppress the uprising. Troopers were able to round up a few of the rebels, but Nat Turner eluded them. Authorities responded with a wide-ranging attack on innocent men, women, and children in response to the Nat-led race massacre. The state militia rounded up and eliminated 120 black men, women, and children, most of whom were not involved in the revolt. Nat stayed on the run for almost two months. He never made it much farther than Southampton. But then in October of 1831, Nat Turner was found hiding on a nearby local farm in a deep ditch. He was captured and in a divine act of biblical poetry, hauled off to prison in Jerusalem, Virginia. Nat Turner's rebellion was a watershed moment in American history, prompting widespread fear and hysteria among white Southerners and galvanizing efforts to tighten control over enslaved individuals. The rebellion intensified debates about the morality and sustainability of slavery, fueling abolitionist sentiment in the North and deepening divisions between North and South. Turner's defiance challenged the myth of black docility and subservience, demonstrating the inherent resistance of enslaved people to their oppression. Turner was tried for conspiring to rebel and make an insurrection. He was convicted and sentenced to death by hanging. Before his death, Nat Turner was asked if he regretted it. His response, was Christ not crucified? He was executed and beheaded in Jerusalem. In the aftermath of the rebellion, scores of enslaved individuals were executed or subjected to harsh reprisals as white authorities sought to quell any further unrest and maintain control over the enslaved population. The legacy of Nat Turner and his rebellion continues to be debated and interpreted by historians, scholars, and activists. Some view Turner as a heroic figure who dared to resist injustice and oppression, while others condemn his methods as indiscriminate and violent. The rebellion's legacy also raises questions about the ethics of armed resistance, the complexities of historical memory, and the enduring legacy of slavery in American society. Nat Turner's slave rebellion stands as a pivotal moment in American history, symbolizing the enduring struggle for freedom and justice in the face of oppression. 
Turner's defiance challenged the institution of slavery and inspired generations of activists to fight for the abolition of slavery and the recognition of the inherent dignity and humanity of all people. Despite its tragic outcome, the rebellion remains a testament to the resilience and resistance of enslaved individuals and serves as a powerful reminder of the ongoing struggle for equality and liberation. <laughs>